of Texas A&M University, and my friend of 27 years, the Honorable Robert Gates. Howdy. Howdy. Waited a long time to do that. <laughs> Fred, thanks for that kind introduction. Uh, President Young, thank you for being here today. Thank all of you for coming out for this occasion. Uh, when I say it's a pleasure to be here, bear in mind that I just a couple of days ago was in Washington, D.C., uh, which has been paralyzed by a blizzard, just like before the blizzard. <laughs> in fact, the only thing unfrozen in Washington these days are Iranian assets. <laughs> it is a pleasure to... Uh, Return to Texas A&M, I have to tell you that leading the Aggies was the best job I ever had. Uh, it certainly uh, was, uh, in, my, in the eyes of my wife, Becky, the best job I ever had. Uh, just as an example, when I went up for confirmation as Secretary of Defense um, in uh, November of 2006, the custom was for nominees' spouses to uh, appear at the hearing and sit supportively in the first row behind the nominee. And the chairman, with some impatience, asked me where Mrs. Gates was. And I said, well, Mr. Chairman, she had a choice this morning. She could either be at this hearing in the United States Senate or she could accompany the Texas A&M women's basketball team to Seattle, Washington, to play the Huskies. And that's where she was. The Children's Center, for some of you may not know, the Children's Center here at Texas A&M is named for Becky. Uh, she actually has a unique distinction among all women in America. She is the only woman to have a children's center name after her, and also be the sponsor of a nuclear attack submarine. <laughs> She's been trying to bring together those two families, but still... Well, we could spend quite a bit of time discussing political leadership in America across the spectrum, and including the presidential campaign. One thing to be said is that candidates like Donald Trump and Senator Sanders have tapped into a very real frustration on the part of many Americans for elected politicians at the national level. And the all too often incompetent, arrogant, dysfunctional, and just plain bossy government they lead. The presidential candidates are talking in one way or another about the problems and inadequacies of government and business. But the candidates are largely focused on primal scream therapy rather than actual solutions. My new book is about how you actually can fix these institutions, how you can change and reform government and other big organizations that govern our day-to-day -day lives and make them work better, be more cost-effective, and more responsive to citizens and customers. Because the truth is, if we don't fix our institutions and do so urgently, it can have catastrophic consequences for our way of life, our financial security, our national security, our freedoms, and at times our very lives. My book and my remarks today are about how the lack of courageous, tough-minded leadership underlies the many failures of institutions in both public and private institute uh, sectors in recent years and how good leaders can transform underperforming and broken organizations despite the political paralysis in washington and elsewhere bureaucracies inexorably intrude ever more pervasively into our lives they influence our health our safety our economic well-being our children what we eat what we drive and every business, farm, and educational institution in the country. 
And yet even as bureaucratic tentacles extend their reach into every nook and cranny of America, the litany of their incompetence, corruption, and arrogance grows exponentially. Many of these institutions are now indispensable to us, but their repeated and highly publicized failures have shaken the public's confidence that they, that government in general, and sometimes business, can do anything right. Just a sampling of the lapses and failures in recent years, regardless of who was minding the store in Congress or the White House, is profoundly disturbing. 9-11 itself, a failure of intelligence and law enforcement of monumental consequence. The failure of virtually all of our financial, regulatory, and administrative bodies to anticipate and prevent the abuses that led to the financial meltdown in 2008. The Federal Emergency Management Agency's handling of the aftermath of Hurricanes Katrina and Sandy and other disasters. The multiple and continuing failures of the Veterans Affairs Department. Challenges to the integrity of the Secret Service. Lapses <clears throat> of the Internal Revenue Service. And lapses and scandals affecting the Secret Service. The initial handling of the Ebola, Ebola crisis by the Centers for Disease Control the botched rollout of the Obamacare website, the waste of billions of dollars on failed procurements in the Defense Department, contaminated water in Flint, Michigan, and so many more. And then there is the everyday travail of Americans in dealing with impenetrable, impersonal, infinitely complex, obdurate, and often arrogant bureaucracies. Social Security, Medicare, local, state, and federal taxing agencies, getting a driver's license, getting a building permit, or remodeling your home, dealing with the phone company, your credit card issuers, a billing error by a big chain store, health care insurance, university and public school administrations. And it's a rare soul who has not been frustrated and maddened by multiple business uh, bureaucracies not to mention disastrous business decisions that cost millions of jobs and create economic turmoil and heartache. Hardly a day passes in the life of any American without having to battle one or another bureaucracy. It doesn't need to be this way. I believe institutions, bureaucracies, large and small, can be fixed, changed, made more cost-effective and user-friendly, efficient, and responsive, and shaped to meet new problems and challenges. I know because with the help of some great colleagues, I did it at three very different institutions I led. The Central Intelligence Agency and the dozen or so other U.S. intelligence agencies, here at Texas A&M, and the Department of Defense, the largest and most complex organization on the planet. And I, my colleagues and I at all three places showed that a dysfunctional political environment is not in itself an overriding impediment to changing and reforming bureaucracies. After all, there wasn't a lot of reform going on in the federal bureaucracy before paralysis set in. You may ask how the lessons I learned in those institutions are applicable for leaders in local and state government other parts of the federal government, education, business, nonprofits, for organizations of every kind. But consider this. In external appearance, people are infinitely diverse. Yet beneath the skin, our anatomy and the way the body works are pretty much the same. So it is with bureaucracies. Each shares a lot of DNA with its kin, even distant cousins. Despite the vast variety of bureaucracies in both the public and private sectors, their cultures, organizational structures, and both internal and outside influences on their operations and behavior are remarkably similar. And thus the strategies and techniques for changing them, for reforming them, are remarkably similar. In truth, virtually every bureaucracy needs to modernize, to reform, to get rid of paralyzing procedural and operational barnacles that have accumulated, reduce waste, and become more efficient, effective, and user-friendly. Reform is not a luxury, but a necessity. With skilled leadership, 
things can be made to work so much better. By showing that things can change, can get better, I hope in some small way to convince Americans that institutions that too often fail us can be reformed and to show that leaders at all levels can make that change come to pass. And so I've written this book. It's a book about people and how to lead them where they often don't want to go. It's about how a leader can make an institution better, both for those who work there and for those they serve. It is a book about improving lives. In the limited time I have this morning, I'll skip over the many concrete suggestions and recommendations in this book about establishing goals and agenda, implementation strategies, and implementation itself. Instead, I want to focus on two central components of change and reform that I write about. The personal characteristics necessary for a leader who would successfully bring change and the relationship between such a leader and those who work in his or her organization. People, not systems, implement an agenda for change. As the leader pursues a reform agenda, he or she cannot overlook the fact that the attitudes and commitment of their employees will determine success or failure. A critical component of a strategy for change is winning the support of those in the trenches who deliver the mission of the organization. Recognition of their role and demonstrating respect for them go a long way. Any fool can and too often does dictate change from the top. Fundamental to enduring success, though, is inclusiveness. Getting as many people involved as possible, especially among the career professionals. Making the effort to prepare various constituencies for change is a step often omitted by new leaders. Real and symbolic actions and gestures of respect toward career employees early on can and does have a significant impact in softening resistance to change and persuading people to be receptive to what a new leader is trying to do. In implementing change in any bureaucracy, the leader must delegate responsibility to subordinates and empower them to carry out the task. Lasting change depends on those below the leader embracing the change and taking ownership, making it their own. The more frequently the leader butts in, implicitly reminding his lieutenants that it's his change, the less they will believe it's theirs. The leader cannot hold individuals accountable for driving change if he refuses to let go of the steering wheel. The leader must trust his subordinates, replace them if necessary, hold them accountable, but he mustn't micromanage them. A leader must provide his or her people with the tools and opportunities for professional success and satisfaction. He or she must empower them and provide them with respect motivation, job satisfaction, upward mobility, personal dignity, esteem, and finally the confidence that as leader he or she genuinely cares about them collectively and individually. You can be the toughest, most demanding leader on the planet and still treat people with respect and dignity. And now a few words about the critical factor in leading organizational reform the leader himself or herself. How does a true leader of reform conduct himself? First, the best leaders have their egos under control. They empower subordinates who are given the lion's share of credit and accolades when success comes. A reform leader's primary goal should be to get the job done, not personal glorification or self-satisfaction. The environment created by an egotist is the antithesis of what is required to lead reform successfully. Second, a leader, whether in the public or private sector, must have integrity. Every leader in public service and business will at some point need to stand apart and alone, to speak truth to power and do the right thing. That can be a very lonely place but it's where leaders who can effectively reform institutions are found. If one seeks to lead men and women, you must persuade them to follow you. 
That means they must trust you. A leader's actions must match his words. Integrity in action becomes moral authority. And it is moral authority that moves people to follow someone even at personal risk or sacrifice. Third, self-discipline is central to the leadership of institutions and to reforming them. Being an effective leader, especially a reform leader, requires a lot of self-control. Silence and restraint are essential, if undervalued tools of leadership. Temper tantrums, desk pounding, yelling by a leader are all an embarrassment and a waste of time and energy. The daughter of the U.S. Chief of Naval Operations in World War II, Admiral Ernest King, once described him as the most even-tempered man she'd ever known. He was always in a rage. (laughs) One of the reasons I believe the leader of an institution, any reformer, must exercise great self-discipline has to do with subordinates. If the boss can't control himself, that sends a signal to those at lower level that such behavior is acceptable. And that hardly creates an environment in which inclusive participatory reform can take place. It sounds old-fashioned, but the leader of an institution needs to be a role model. Fourth, courage is not a word that automatically pops into mind when thinking about bureaucracies. But any time a mid-level leader in government or business tells his boss and his colleagues that the old way of doing things is no longer adequate and that change is necessary, it is a courageous act. Even when the man or woman in charge takes a stand that most people at least initially oppose, it requires courage. Fifth, another key aspect of successfully reforming institutions, public or private, is taking the work seriously but not yourself. Never underestimate the power of humor. Dwight D. Eisenhower wrote to his son in 1943, and I quote, The one quality that can be developed by studious reflection and practice is the leadership of men. The idea is to get people working together because they instinctively want to do it for you. Essentially, you must be devoted to duty, sincere, fair, and cheerful. Devotion to duty, sincerity, fairness, good cheer. These are not qualities taught in school. Formal education can make someone a good manager, but it cannot make a leader. Because leadership is more about the heart than the head. How does any organization teach courage, integrity, a love of people, a sense of humor, the ability to dream of a better future. How can any training program inculcate personal character and honor? Core to leadership is the ability to relate to people, to empathize, understand, inspire, and motivate. If you fundamentally don't like or respect most people, or if you think you're superior to others, chances are you won't be much of a leader at least in a democracy like ours. Just because you're high on the organizational ladder and can tell people what to do does not make you a leader, just a boss. I'll conclude with a few words specifically addressed to public service, which seems especially appropriate in this place and with the Bush School next door. The columnist Walter Lippmann wrote long ago, Those in high places are more than the administrators of government bureaus. They are more than the writers of laws. They are the custodians of the nation's ideals, of the beliefs it cherishes, of its permanent hopes, of the faith which makes a nation out of a mere aggregation of individuals. If you scratch deeply enough, you will find that most of those in public service, the custodians, no matter how outwardly tough or jaded, are in their heart of hearts romantics, idealists, and optimists. They actually believe that it is possible to make the lives of their fellow citizens better and the world a safer place. But an important part of what makes America unique is that our nation's ideals, hopes, and faith 
are manifested not only in individuals, but in our institutions. Accordingly, we can only bring our ideals alive, fulfill our hopes, and strengthen our faith as a country by improving the institutions that are the instruments through which we can achieve those goals. The question is whether new leaders, new agents of change, are up to the challenge. President Harry Truman once said, Every great achievement is the story of a flaming heart. The task of reforming institutions is a difficult one. A leader's heart must be on fire with the belief in what he seeks to do. Changing institutions is a battle and must be undertaken with courage and strength and conviction. The leader must believe in it before he or she can persuade others to believe in it. The leader must be prepared to put his or her job on the line if asking others to risk their careers and their reputations to help. President John Adams wrote to his son, Public business, my son, must always be done by somebody. It will always be done by somebody or another. If wise men decline it, others will not. If honest men refuse it, others will not. My fervent hope is that this book will encourage the wise and honest among us, especially young people, to consider serving our fellow Americans with confidence that public institutions can be reformed and shaped to serve and to succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. We appreciate it. Uh, you're sharing with us some of the nuggets from uh, your new book and your experiences. And I'd like to sort of start there. Uh, after spending 50 years in public service, director of the CIA, president here at Texas A&M, secretary of defense, you undoubtedly enco- encountered a number of leaders uh, that you think sort of gave you these qualities that you picked up or you or you saw it in them. Can you kind of talk to us about some of the leaders that you encountered during those 50 years uh, that kept that helped you inform the book that you've shared with us? Well, I uh, I start the last chapter of the book by saying that my first leadership experience was as a patrol leader in my Boy Scout troop in Wichita. And that nothing teaches leadership skills like trying to get a bunch of 11 and 12 year old boys to do what they don't want to do when you can't make them do it and you're only a year older than they are. (laughs) (laughs) Even the Congress was easy compared to that. Uh, No, I, you know, and it's interesting because people say, well, who was your, your great mentor and uh, you're, you're the most important mentor. And what I particularly tell young people is, um, that that people as they young people as they grow need to have a series of mentors and and people who as the young person rises and gets more responsibility mentors at at ever increasing levels of seniority who can keep teaching them and helping them along the path so my first mentor um, was uh, a GS-15 at CIA, and as I like to say, my last mentor was the President of the United States. Um, I there were I learned, quite frankly, and I'll I'll be judicious here for once. <laughs> the truth is, you learn as much from bad bosses as you do from good bosses, and a lot of what I said about how you treat people. Uh, I learned from bad bosses uh, uh, who didn't do that. And, and, but I've had a number of uh, people along the way that I think <coughs> have, have played a big role for me. 
Uh, William Webster, who was the uh, director of the FBI for nine years, a federal circuit court judge, became director of the FBI, then became director of CIA, and I was his deputy for a while. And Bill taught me a lot about an inclusive style of management and bringing change. And uh, Brent Scowcroft, uh, national security advisor, uh, taught me a lot about dealing with people and temperament and, and so on. Um, I'll tell you one anecdote that's in the book <coughs> from, from another mentor, and that was Spignev Brzezinski, uh, President Carter's national security advisor. And it, and it shows how a tiny gesture has dramatic impact. I was, Brzezinski was flying to Cairo for uh, the final, uh, putting the final touches on the Camp David Accords in 1978. And I was along as his executive assistant. And we met with President Sadat uh, one evening. And we, we were flying in a couple of days before Carter got there. Now this was 38 years ago. But I have never forgotten that Spig introduced me to President Sadat as his colleague. Not as his aide, not as his assistant, not as his gopher, but as his colleague. That was 38 years ago. Now, of course, the past master and maybe greatest role model is the man for whom this entire complex is named. Uh, in terms of how you treat people, and I've written repeatedly and talked often that President Bush treated the maintenance workers and the household staff at the Pentagon, at the, the White House, just the way he treated foreign leaders and cabinet officers. And he was always interested them, in them as people. It wasn't just hollow gestures. He knew their names. He knew their uh, members of their family. If they, he'd talk sports with them. He'd invite them to uh, play horseshoes. If one of their children were sick, he would inquire. If one of their children or one of those individuals got an award of some kind, he, he would write a note or something. He truly cared for people. And the way he was willing to surround himself with really smart, independent people and listen to them and then integrate their views with his own instincts and judgment um, I first started observing him up close when he became vice president. Ironically, I was down at the White House when he was director of CIA. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but I will say this about his time at CIA. He, to this day, and it's not just because he was president, remains, I think, the most popular director in CIA's history. And part of it was because in a time of great difficulty... Uh, for the agency. It was under investigation from everybody. Everybody was coming after him. And when George Bush became the director of CIA, he made them feel once more like what they did was important and, and why they contributed to the national security. He made them feel good about themselves again. And they've never forgotten it. Even people uh, who weren't there for years after he be was director became and were instilled with the lore of that time. So a number of these people were, were role models and mentors for me and, and, um, and taught me the skills. I'll, I'll, one of the things that I make a lot of in duty was, I'll, I'll cite one example of a bad boss, uh, <laughs> is that I, when I became secretary, I walked into the building, into the Pentagon, absolutely alone. I didn't even take a secretary. I, my message was... I trust all of you, and I figure that with the right leadership, we can get this done. And in the middle of two wars, fighting two wars, which at that time we were losing, I didn't, I didn't want to send the message of a lack of confidence in those people. By contrast, there was a director of CIA who came into uh, the position in the 70s, and he came from another government organization, uh, the Pentagon, I won't say which service, <laughs> and he brought 60 aides with him. And he never got past it the rest of the time he was at the agency because the message was, I don't trust any of you. 
And remembering that was one reason I walked into the Pentagon alone. Let's talk efficiency a little bit. You alluded to this in your talk a few minutes ago, that it's not just the government that sometimes frustrates citizens, whether it's the handling of the Ebola crisis, the water in Flint, <laughs> Michigan, uh, or trying to get a driver's license renewed or a permit to do some construction on your house. How can, how can these institutions be made more efficient so that those of us who are being served by them uh, will feel as though uh, they're there for us? First of all, you need somebody in charge of those organizations who feel that better efficiency, being more user-friendly, and treating people right is actually really important. And uh, and I'll give you my I'll give you an example, and and it's actually of getting a driver's license. So I spent most of my adult life in Virginia. Getting a driver's license in the Commonwealth of Virginia is comparable to the sacking of Rome by the barbarians. I I I second that. It is a horrible experience. The people are surly. The lines are long. They have no interest in serving you. It just was horrible. And registering a car is the same thing. So we moved to the Pacific Northwest, and I live in a rural county called Skagit County. And I have to register a car, so I'm prepared for this kind of all-morning battle. And I take all the paperwork, and I go to the window. First of all, there's no line. I walk up. A woman greets me with a big smile. How can I help you? And I say, here, I got all these cars. Oh, yeah, I'd be happy to help you. And she gets through it all, and she says, you know, you're missing a couple of things. I thought, oh, God, you know, how many more trips back here am I going to She said, that's all right. I'll go ahead and process the paperwork, and you just bring them in when you can, uh, when you can get back down here. I said, wait a minute. Where am I? Wait a minute. <laughs> Have I died and gone to heaven? Uh, but, but it requires a leader who sets the tone. And, and one of the points that I make repeatedly in the book is... And if you want to find out what's not working and why things don't move as quickly, often the people who are on the front lines understand that better than anybody. And the problem is nobody ever asks them. And and often they also have really good solutions. So every time I did that when I was here at Texas A&M, and, and I also, when I was at the Pentagon, Every time I visited a military post, but especially in Iraq and Afghanistan, I would have private lunches with a group of junior officers or junior NCOs, and I wouldn't let any of their commanders in the room, which drove the commanders nuts. And, and I said, tell me what you need. Tell me what's going wrong. What do you need? And I heard things that I would never have heard back in the Pentagon that I was able then to pursue. I'll, I'll tell you one of my favorites from one of these kids. This is, a, this is at a forward operating base in Afghanistan. And, uh, and we're having a sandwich, and, and there's, there's about ten of these kids. And, one of, and I say, okay, kind of open up. And so there was a little conversation and everything. And one of the kids stuck up his hand and says, well, I, I'll tell you a problem. And, and the, uh, the combat fatigues that kids wear are called BDU, battle dress uniform. And um, this kid held up his hand. He said, the crotches in the BDUs are too weak. (laughs) I said, really? (laughs) He said, yeah. When you're climbing over a wall or over a fence or something, they rip out all the time. And then he went on. He said, you know, it's okay in the summertime, but in the winter it gets a little dicey. (laughs) Believe me, I'd have never heard that in the Pentagon. (laughs) So, you know, but I think, I think that the way you get at these problems, first of all, is the leader setting the tone and saying this actually is important that we do this right. But then the other is, is listening to people, whether it's customers or your own frontline people, on what the problem is. And, and it's amazing, actually, how little it takes to make a difference. I've got one more question, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. I don't want to ask you a linear question like, what was the toughest decision you made while you were at DOD or leading the Pentagon and leading the defense 
uh, part of our government. <coughs> but I'd like to ask it sort of another way. Talk to us about those tough decisions you mentioned in your talk where, you know, it boils down to being you're the only guy in the room and you're going to have to, like, sometimes do it alone and how lonely it can sometimes be when these big decisions, important decisions are made. Well, I'll give you, I'll give you three examples, one from Texas A&M and two from the Pentagon, and I'll do the Pentagon first. Um, the first was I read in the newspapers literally three months after I'd become secretary that there was this new armored vehicle that the Marines had a few of in Anbar province that there had been 300 attacks on these vehicles and not a single Marine had been killed. So I said, why aren't we building these and getting them out in the field? Nobody in the Pentagon wanted to build these things. Um, they were heavy. They were not in the long-term procurement plan. They were, people in the Pentagon kept thinking, well, the war, these wars are going to be over pretty quickly. Let's not make major investments in equipment we may not be able to use once the wars are over. And the, the secret to these heavily armored vehicles was not only the armor, but it had a V-shaped hole so that the blast from one of these IEDs would be deflected. Uh, so after, after doing some study and having it looked at very carefully, but on a very urgent basis, uh, I gave direction that we were going to build these things and send them to Iraq and Afghanistan. And, and to cut to the chase, uh, we built 27,000 of these vehicles. And, and sent them to Iraq and then sent an all-terrain version to Afghanistan. But when I made that decision, there was not a single senior military or civilian official in the department who supported it. It was one instance when I had a, it was one instance when I had a lot of support on the Hill. And they just gave us the money to do it. And I can't tell you how many lives and limbs were saved by those MRAPs, uh, uh, mine-resistant, ambush-protected vehicles. And there would be these terrible explosions that would de destroy these trucks, and you'd have four or five kids get out of the back, uh, basically uninjured or with bumps and bruises. Uh, but, but nobody supported that. Same way when... I, when <laughs> I, I, was, I was informed by somebody that the medical evacuate, the airlift medevac time in Afghanistan was two hours compared to the one hour in Iraq. And I said, well, that's unacceptable. And, and then the joint staff and others came in and the civilians in the personnel and uh, uh, Department of the uh, part of the department came in and showed me all these uh, PowerPoint slides on statistical survival rates and that the survival rates were already so high that if you if you didn't uh, if the difference between two hours and one hour was statistically insignificant and I said I don't care I said I think we have a moral obligation to these kids if I'm a soldier and I've just been blown up. I want a helicopter there. So we're going to do it. Again, not one person supported it. And I had no data. It just seemed to me the right thing to do. Now, interestingly enough, um, the Journal of the American Medical Association just last fall published an article looking at survival rates. And I finally now have the data <laughs> that I lacked. And they estimate purely statistically that somewhere between 450 and 500 lives were saved by changing the medevac time. Okay. So the challenge here at A&M, when I was basically alone, <laughs> was <clears throat> my determination to increase diversity. And I talk in the book about the need to shape strategies to fit the culture of the institution that you lead. And I knew, first of all, there were a lot of folks here at A&M 
who frankly didn't think diversity was terribly important and it sure wasn't worth spending much money on. And in my image, I had in my mind, at some point, there is going to be a governor and two senators in Texas, all of whom are Hispanic, and they're going to be sitting having a, a drink, and one of them is going to say to the others, what did Texas A&M ever do for you? And I wanted the answer to be everything. So I was determined to, to, to change this approach. But I also knew that this is a conservative university with consumer conservative former students, very conservative regents. Uh, and so I knew that affirmative action was not the answer. I also wasn't entirely convinced that affirmative action would work. Uh, and so I announced on December 3rd, uh, 2003, that we were going to, what we were going to do to try and increase diversity. We were going to create 2,400 new scholarships, regents scholarships for uh, students who uh, were first-generation college students and who came from families of less than uh, 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 family income of less than forty thousand dollars. So, just statistically in the state, about two-thirds of those seventy percent went to minorities, and about and the remainder to poor whites. And and I announced we we're going to put in permanent recruitment uh, student recruitment uh, prospective student centers so all along the border and in all the big cities in predominantly minority areas. And we we're going to have, particularly in the Hispanic areas, bilingual uh, admissions and financial aid officers to show families how we could, how their child could come to A&M and not, uh, uh, not go into heavy debt. And... Uh, and, and then I said, and oh, by the way, we're, this is going to be merit-based admissions. We're not going to use affirmative action. And uh, let's just say, as I put it in the book, it hit the fan. <laughs> uh, and, and there were a lot of people, you know, the regents, uh, a lot of uh, former students and others who... Uh, really applauded that, that that was the way we were going to go about it, merit-based admissions. Until two days later, I announced, oh, by the way, we're not going to use legacy either. Whoa. You can't have it both ways. If it's going to be merit-based admissions, it's going to be merit-based admissions. Now, the state, the minority members of the state legislature called me to Austin. And I testified for a long time in front of the Congress. So I was kind of inured to this. But I sat there and just got the crap beaten out of me for about two hours. And I will tell you this. I had, I had taken some steps when I first came to A&M to improve our record in the use of historically uh, uh, in uh, minority-owned businesses. And it had impressed Royce West, who was a state senator from uh, uh, Dallas. And, and although Royce joined in the chorus in the state capitol, behind the scenes he was telling people, listen to him. He delivered before. Give him a chance. And so when I went to Dallas, Royce <clears throat> took me to community leader meetings. He took me to the Dallas uh, Morning News uh, editorial board. But when I announced all of this, there was not a big line of people in support behind me. I will say one person who was immensely helpful in terms of moral support as well as being out there in front supporting me was R.C. Slocum. And R.C., was terrific, and and uh, the the results are in the statistics, and I have these in the book. When I became president of Texas A and M, A and M rep, minorities were about ten and a half percent of the student body. Um, eight years later, um, they represented almost twenty eight percent of the student body, and two years after I announced these changes, 
the front page of the journal, uh, the Chronicle of Higher Education, ran an article basically saying, why is Texas A&M being so much more successful in recruiting minorities than universities like the University of Michigan, Ohio State, UCLA, and others? But when I announced that, as I say, there was not exactly a chorus of support anywhere. Great example. And a great job. All right, we've got time for a couple of questions, maybe more than a couple from the audience. Uh, man the microphone or woman the microphone, whichever. Yes, sir. And I actually have a question, and then I'll help man the microphone, as that's my job. But <laughs> first and foremost, thank you for coming and speaking to us. Um, I wanted to let you know that when you said something about hollow words and really getting on the front line and being there in person, it really does mean a lot. Um, I don't know if you remember, but 10 years ago, you actually used to go and help students move into their dorms. You'd put on your shorts, you'd put on your baseball cap, and you'd try and sneak through and not be noticed. But you Yeah, but the truth is, with each passing year, I tended to be quick to move toward the toward the big bad bag from Bed Bath and Beyond <laughs> <laughs> instead of carrying their little refrigerator. <laughs> Well, 10 years ago, I was 15 years old, and I was helping my sister move into her dorm, and you actually helped me carry a trunk, not a Bed Bath & Beyond bag, (laughs) up four flights of stairs. And I just wanted to make sure everyone knew that when you said you can't have hollow words, every little thing matters, it really does, and you impress that on me. I think you impress that on a lot of the Bush School students, so thank you. Thank you. Hello again. Like he said, I, I can't thank you enough for coming as well as for the countless years of public service that you've, you've offered our country. Thank you, sir. Um, the, the question that I have is also going to start with a statement, which is at the end of your, your beginning there, you mentioned that one of your hopes for the book is to inspire the next generation. Well, I stand before you as that, that next generation who has been greatly inspired, not only by the books, but more the, the life that you've led within that public service. So I, I can't say definitively that you've achieved that goal for me personally. Um, you mentioned the flaming heart, you know, the, the heart for the, the passion and desire um, for public service. What would you say as the biggest advice to somebody um, stepping foot into that world uh, on how to work with and how to uh, deal with the fire extinguishers, so to speak, and uh, those, those obstacles that you face? I told the, I told the Corps of Cadets at uh, West Point one time, and speaking to all of them, I said, you know, the truth is, you will at some point in your career work for a jackass. <laughs> because we all have. <laughs> and, and I think the, the key is to, it, it ties in with the advice that I, that I give to young people, which is when you get a job, stay long enough to establish a reputation for competence, hard work, and dedication so that you carry that with you and that generally is at least two three four years uh, and and then I think you need to be a risk taker and if you if you're working for somebody who creates an environment that is intolerable you want to you want to always have, have by establishing a reputation for capability you want to be in a position where other alternatives may be available to you. Uh, sometimes, sometimes it helps. I mean, believe me, uh, every organization has toxic bosses, including the military. And sometimes the solution is to quietly tell somebody else what's going on. Because people up the chain don't want to lose good people. My, when I was a young analyst, uh, we had a new branch chief, and there were probably eight of us in the branch, maybe ten. And he gave, and we were all recognized as pretty good analysts, as good analysts, in fact. And and this guy gave us all a bad uh, evaluation one year. 
And a couple of the others, I didn't do it, but a couple of others went up the chain of command and said, you know, you're going to lose all these people. We're all going to leave if you don't change this. And lo and behold, they moved that guy out three months later. So, so the key is not to settle. If you're in a toxic environment, if you're working for a fire extinguisher, either if depending on relationships that you have with others, uh, you know, one of the things that would happen in the Pentagon would be that um, one of the things that would happen in the Pentagon is that uh, you know, just at the senior level, um, somebody that was a friend of my chief of staff would say, you know, this general officer is really having a bad effect on his unit. And there are ways of getting that word to those people's bosses. Uh, and, you know, you, want, you need to be very careful about that because you don't want to be seen as somebody who's disloyal. But by the same token, the, the organization's being hurt by somebody like that. But again, I, I think risk-taking, uh, establishing a reputation so that at some point when you feel like you need to move on or when you feel like you've gone as far as you can in that place or you just want to try something different, you have some options. Um, but I think, I think the worst thing is to stay so long that you become so disillusioned that you leave. So you do need some patience. Uh, but what you, and and I, I come back to risk taking. When I was first invited to go to the White House, uh, to the NSC to work for Henry Kissinger on the Soviet desk, I'd only been in the agency six years. And when I told my bosses I'd been invited, that I'd gotten this invitation to go, they said, well, we won't block you, but you need to know there probably won't be a job for you when you come back. <laughs> I said, okay. okay. Now, the interesting thing is that most of those guys were still there when I became director. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hello, sir. My name is Catherine Williams, and thank you so much for coming to speak to us today. I really appreciate it. As a student who's about to graduate and enter public service with an interest in national security, an issue that is often at the front of my mind is the uh, Islamic State threat. And I wanted to hear your opinion on what you think the U.S.'s role in the next coming years will be in the counter-ISIS situation. Well, I think I think that the problem in the Middle East actually is broader than ISIS. I think that uh, I think we face a generation of conflict in the Middle East. There are four conflicts going on simultaneously. One is Shia Islam led by Iran versus Sunni Islam led by Saudi Arabia, authoritarians versus reformers, secularists versus Islamists, and then really dangerous. Um, the question whether artificially created states with historically adversarial ethnic, religious, and tribal groups such as Syria, Libya, and Iraq can actually hold together. I'm, very, I'm actually pretty pessimistic on that score. And because of all of these conflicts, we are going to have a violence and turmoil in that region I think, for 25 years. And I think at the end of that time, the borders in the Middle East may look very different than they do right now. So ISIS is a piece of that. They take advantage of the chaos in Syria. They take advantage of the anti-Sunni uh, policies of the uh, government in Baghdad that is influenced so heavily by Iran. Uh, and then you have the Turks and their focus on the Kurds and so on. So I, I think that uh, I think that the strategy of uh, strangling ISIS, of slowly denying them, taking back territory and so on, is probably the one most likely to succeed. I'm, uh, I think a lot depends on whether any kind of a settlement can be achieved in Syria. I'm terribly pessimistic about that. Um, uh, just because I think finding finding any group of people in that country together today that'll work together is going to be almost impossible. So 
I think I think the we need to we need to contain ISIS and reduce the caliphate in the region, but we also have to be aware that like Al Qaeda, it metastasizes. It's metastasizing, and so you've got them in Libya and, and other places, and then the capacity for uh, self radicalization um, by lone wolves, whether in Europe or in the United States of people who are online or through their local uh, mosque or whatever have become radicalized and are willing to undertake violent actions. And, and to me, here at home, a big part of that is engaging and getting the Islamic communities, Muslim communities, and Muslim parents involved in terms of providing early warning if they think their son is being radicalized or if they think one of their... Uh, members of their mosque is being radicalized and so on to help law enforcement get ahead of these things and try and and deal with them. Uh, I think that the president has underestimated the psychological effect of the attacks in this country, such as in San Bernardino, uh, but also in Europe, partly just because of the randomness. Statistically, you're about 10,000 times more likely to get hit by lightning but that still doesn't reduce the fear. The statistics, going back to my uh, medevac thing, the statistics are kind of irrelevant. If people are, uh, are apprehensive, that's a reality in and of itself, and you have to deal with that. But I think the ISIS is part of a bigger problem in the Middle East that we're going to be faced with for a very long time. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. My name is Ellie Freeman. I'm a first-year student at the Bush School. Thanks so much for coming. On the topic of leadership, my question is, as a leader, when it's your responsibility to motivate others, inspire them, empower them, and have the courage to stand alone, what was it for you that motivated you enough to motivate others even when times are hard? Well, I think that... um, I think that... um, you know, if I go back to um, to the Eisenhower quote, I think most of the people who worked with me um, saw those qualities, a devotion to duty, uh, fairness, sincerity, and good cheer. Uh, and the, the premise of my book, and I talk about it at the very beginning, is that the people who work in these institutions, in any organization, want to be proud of it. They didn't join to be a part of a bunch of losers. They want to be proud of their organization, and that is the reformer's greatest hidden asset. And how do you tap into that desire to be a part of a winning organization, of an organization that is esteemed, that in the community people are proud of because of how well it works and how easy they are to deal with. (coughs) And I think think figuring out, getting people to tapping into that innate pride, uh, I think whether it's at A&M or in much smaller organizations, that's where you get the, the, the people delivering the mission uh, to be on side and to be your partners in reform rather than an obstacle to reform. One more. Yes, sir. <coughs> Thank you very much, sir. My name is Reza. I'm from Afghanistan. Twelve years back, I was a hopeless boy and did not have any future. Today, I am standing here and will soon graduate from the Bush School. <laughs> on behalf of On behalf of myself, my family, and my generation in Afghanistan, I sincerely thank you, the American people, for what you did for our country. Without your support, I would not have been standing today here. I have a question. You said that as part of leadership, we need to take our duty, our job seriously, not ourselves. Out of your experience working with leaders in countries like Afghanistan, what is one thing missing in their leadership that when I go there and my generation 
we, we change that. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. Uh, I have to tell you that in uh, four and a half years, I did not meet a whole lot of leaders around the world, including in Iraq and Afghanistan, who had a sen- much of a sense of humor. <laughs> but then most of them didn't have much to laugh about. And, and uh, I, think that, I think there is still in too many societies, and I would say including in Iraq and Afghanistan, a, a tendency on the part of leaders to become increasingly authoritarian, even if democratically elected. And uh, to, and I think in some ways we have seen the personification of this in some ways is President Erdogan of Turkey, uh, who really, when he first became prime minister, was very open and very reform-oriented and so on. But, but increasingly he has closed his circle. He has shut out people who disagree with him. And he, uh, and he has become uh, more authoritarian. I think, I think that this happened with President Karzai. Um, and, it, and, it's, and it's fairly characteristic. So uh, I, think that, I think leaders who have a more humble sense of themselves are more prevalent in longstanding democracies. Um, you better learn to li- laugh at yourself because at one point or another, everybody else is laughing at you. Uh, and as, as Churchill uh, once put it, it's better to be laughed with than at. And, and so I, I, this is an evolutionary kind of thing. I mean, I found all these leaders very engaging and with a, with a good sense of humor in private meetings with me. But I think there's the sense that that's, that's somehow undignified in public. But I, I think it'll come over time. One thing. This is a request. Will you pre- please run for president? <laughs> you want that briar patch? <laughs> My wife knows where you live. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here today. We have a special little presentation here. It's just a little something to take home uh, that we'd like. More to, Aggie stuff. More Aggie stuff. <laughs> uh, as if you don't have enough. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, Bob is going to sign some books, I think, uh, after we get done here. And uh, we might want to pop up and say hi to the folks next door. Otherwise, thank you all for being here. If you're not a member of the foundation, please join up. And you get invited to these things all the time. Thank you so much for your support. <laughs>